Alan Michael Lapsley was born in New Zealand on June 2nd, 1949. I was born and brought up in New Zealand, this very small country. And my parents, uh, in terms of a developed country, were quite poor. So I remember hard work, lack of money, but not poverty in the sense of ever having gone to bed hungry. Both my parents were loving, committed Christians, so I was brought up very much in a uh, church environment and was, since I was a child, was quite a religious child uh, and interested in issues of faith. His interest in issues of faith grew into a calling, and at the age of 17, he traveled to Australia to become a priest in the Anglican Church. At the end of high school, I went to begin my training to be a priest. In some ways, when I look back, it's quite amazing that they actually permitted me at the age of 17 to leave the country, to go to another country, and to train to be, uh, to be a priest. Michael Lapsley joined the Anglican religious community in Australia in 1967. In 1971, he took his vows in the Society of the Sacred Mission. Lapsley was ordained as a priest in 1973. In that same year, the community chose to transfer him to South Africa to enroll in undergraduate studies in the city of Durban. It was in South Africa that Father Michael's life would be changed forever. Nothing prepared me for South Africa. I had read and read and read and yet I'd understood nothing as I look back. And I suppose I thought that when I arrived in South Africa, I'd find three groups of people, the oppressed, the oppressor, and if you like, the human race that I would belong to. And uh, I often say that when I arrived in South Africa, I stopped being a human being and I became a white man. Because from the moment of my arrival, every single aspect of my life was decided by the color of my skin. Fate landed Father Michael in South Africa during the height of the apartheid repression and escalating violence. Far from being an ordinary student, his appointment as chaplain to both white students and black students on two campuses gave him a unique perspective. I wasn't simply living in this white cocoon of white privilege, but I was seeing day by day and relating to people who were um, at the receiving end of uh, racial oppression. Uh, and feeling its wrongness and its injustice. For Father Michael, this would be a test of faith. What does a man of God do in the face of injustice? From earliest childhood, had an understanding of Christianity that meant that all human beings were made in God's image and likeness. All human beings had value simply because we're human. My experience from the day I arrived in South Africa was this was the very opposite of Christianity. Because here was a society in which all value derived from the color of your skin, not from the commonness of your humanity. While theological questions of right and wrong, good and evil, swirled in his mind, Father Michael was faced with a very practical question of which side was he on? The oppressed or the oppressor? In a way, I suppose, from the beginning, I guess I had, in a crude sense, two choices. Beat them or join them. And I guess in my heart of hearts, I decided to beat them. Ever increasingly, my life became committed to ending that system. Over the next three years, Father Michael spoke out against the injustices of apartheid and became active in the anti-apartheid movement. It all came to a head in 1976 when school children began to protest having to learn their lessons in Afrikaans. 
and the fact that the education they were receiving was inferior. During a, that period of more than a year, more than a thousand school children were shot on the streets of South Africa. And then vast numbers were detained, imprisoned, tortured. Shortly after that, I was then expelled from South Africa. I had begun to speak out against the killing of children, but also against the torture and the detention of students and young people. Uh, but when I was expelled, there was no formal reason given. Uh, and so then in agreement with my community, I went to live in Lesotho, where my community had also been working for a long time. After being expelled in September of 1976, Father Michael moved to Lesotho, where he continued his studies and joined the African National Congress. He became one of the chaplains to the ANC in exile. Philosophically, ideologically, theologically, I was immensely attracted immediately to the ANC. The, 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 the stumbling block was, a, was that I was a committed pacifist, and the ANC, after 50 years of nonviolent struggle, had actually opted for arms. But the killing of uh, school children pushed me over the edge, and I began to say, in this context, as a last resort, when all other options, all other avenues are are closed, uh, people do have a right to defend themselves. And so if you like, the last hurdle had been crossed that made it possible for me um, to join uh, the African National Congress of South Africa. There are many people who feel that it is useless and futile for us to continue talking peace and non-violence against a government whose reply is only savage attacks on an unarmed and defenseless people. In 1982, 100 South African commandos raided the city of Maseru, Lesotho, in search of ANC members who were believed to be in hiding. 42 people were killed, including five women and two children. After the attack, Father Michael moved to Zimbabwe. As years passed, we became the hunted. By the time I left Lesotho, uh, you never drove a car without looking underneath it to see whether a bomb had been uh, place there. It was in Zimbabwe in 1990, three months after ANC leader Nelson Mandela's release from prison, that Father Michael was sent a letter bomb by the apartheid regime. It was hidden inside of two religious magazines. He lost both hands and sight in one eye in the blast and was seriously burned. We know that it was part of the machinery of the apartheid state. It wasn't a, you know, an individual act, but it was part of the machineries of death of the apartheid state that endured beyond 1990. The act of opening the magazine was the detonating device for a bomb. I can still remember what happened. Uh, the actual explosion, it's still, it's still something with me. Um, I remember pain of a scale that I didn't think a human being could ever um, experience. I remember going into darkness, being, being thrown backwards by the force of the bomb. Um, the exact angle saved my life that I opened it. I opened it on, this, on a small coffee table. If I'd opened it in a something like this, a table like this, it would have killed me because it would have knocked out the, the heart or knocked off the head. But I've always been clear that the person I hold responsible ultimately for my bombing is F.W. de Klerk. I spoke, I've said that I'm not filled with hatred or bitterness or self-pity, nor that I want revenge. I think, I think what I believe in is not retribution, I believe in restorative justice. If, if F.W was to come to me, or the person who made the bomb was to come to me and said, I'm sorry for what I did, and I want your forgiveness, and this is what I am now doing in the way of reparation, not to me personally, but to our country and our people. These are the kinds of things I'm doing to heal our land. 
then of course one would say, of course, yes, forgiveness. There would not be a problem about that. Father Michael returned to South Africa in 1992. He became the chaplain of the Trauma Center for Victims of Violence and Torture in Cape Town. The center assisted South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It was there that he became aware of the tremendous healing power of telling your story. All South Africans had been damaged by their experience of the apartheid years, no matter what side they were on. Also that all of us had a story to tell. All of us carried stuff inside of us as a consequence um, of the journey the nation had traveled. This work led to the founding of the Institute for the Healing of Memory in 1998. This workshop is a journey. It's a journey that is going to focus not so much on what we think, but on what we feel. He started giving workshops that enable South Africans of all races to tell their stories of pain and trauma. Your heroic determination. Your commitment to justice. Viva! It helped me to open up. I think it's there that I managed to say things that I never even told my mother. I was able to express myself, my story, my feelings. And for the first time somebody was listening. I cried for all the pain of the apartheid that affected my life. I cried because of all the anger. I could put my arm on the shoulder of people that I've never been so close to before. And that, uh, for me as a white person, it meant a tremendous lot to me. Father Michael soon realized that telling these stories in a safe, supportive environment helped to start the process of healing. He believes that the entire human family is burdened with trauma of one kind or another because of what we've done, what was done to us, and what we have failed to do. Therefore, everyone, young and old, rich and poor, could benefit by telling their story. Father Michael now travels throughout Africa, Europe, North America, and the South Pacific, giving healing of memory workshops to help heal the world one story at a time. At some point in everybody's life, there's some kind of trauma from which they need to heal. But where people have been particularly oppressed, where people have gone through situations of war or oppression, uh, then there is an even greater need for healing to take place. And so human beings everywhere need to find the way of detoxifying, if you like, vomiting out the poison of the things that have happened to them so that they may indeed uh, integrate into their lives what has happened but also lead uh, free, fulfilling and whole lives.